What is going on, you guys? Welcome back to Down to the Wire. I'm your host, Brian Costa, and we have got a lot to talk about. It's been about two weeks since my last episode, so I'm ready to get back and talk some sports with y'all. So uh, strap in. It's going to be a great time. First of all, I want to say that we got a great guest selection on this show today. It's two guys that have podcasts as well. They are uh, very well versed in this. First up, I want to welcome back on the man, Adam Wright. He is the football podcast, Fumble Rooski, the Fumble Rooski show. Uh, Adam, you know, you're know you doing great stuff over there. I know it's the off season right now, but make sure you go give him a listen. And then secondly, I want to welcome on Robert Shelley from the Pesky Pull podcast. It's been a little while since Robert's been making shows, but he has come back is starting tomorrow. So I hope you guys tune in and listen to that. Rob, Adam, how are you guys doing today? Uh, first I'm of all, doing correction. Jesus. Correction, we've already had <laughs> one person talking twice. at once, Rob. Okay, no, no, no. I'm I'm more important. He's he's that. rusty. He hasn't po- published hey, an hey, episode hey. in quite a while. I okay. We just posted an episode last week, first of all. Second of all, you're right. <laughs> yep. Yep. <laughs> There's nothing but to say there. Bro, but I'm more since, important. since you since you two don't know how to talk for each other, Adam, you were introduced <laughs> first. So Adam, how are you doing tonight? In all seriousness, I'm doing great. Thanks for having me on, Brian. Uh, this is going to be a great episode. Haven't gotten the chance to talk uh, much baseball or uh, basketball since it my show is predominantly football, but definitely go check out my podcast, Fumble Rooski Podcast. Predominantly NFL. We're in our off season coverage, but uh, which is the summer, not the ba- not the not the funnest time, but we make it work. We have our player rankings for each position going into the 2023 NFL season and division previews, how each division is going to stack up. So it's all good stuff. But thanks for having me on, Brian. I really appreciate it. 100%, man. And then, Rob, obviously, I just kind of gave you a little preview about uh, what you've been up to with your show. But I'll let you kind of let you kind of open it up and, and, you know, I'll give you the floor right here. Yeah, um, I'm just here so I won't get fined. Thank you. Anthony no. Richardson quoting Marshawn Lynch <laughs> quoting. Yeah, but in all honesty, Rob, it's glad to have you back as well. Hey, thanks, buddy. We're doing great over here out in Denver. It's a parade inside my city. Yeah. Screw you, this. All right. He spent <laughs> too much time in Denver. Yeah. I, I mean, the, it's Denver. I mean, honestly, it's like it's pretty demographically accurate. Uh, but anywho. Uh, Rob, I did want to get you on the show specifically because you are in Denver and, you know, we're going to talk a lot about some baseball, as Adam mentioned, and some football. But uh, the main thing um, is because, Rob, you are in Denver. You're out there right now as the Denver Nuggets just won their first title in NBA history. And I kind of almost wanted to get you as like that reporter on the ground, kind of get a little sense of of what the atmosphere is out there. I know that, you know, Denver has been a city mostly known for football, has had some success with the Rockies making the World Series in 2007. But for the most part, that is a football town. So, Rob, tell me, what is how are things out there right now after this championship? So there's a lot of good and bad out here. First of all, the city deserved it after watching yeah. Russell Wilson. Sorry, you know what, for 17 <laughs> games last year. So yeah. the city deserved it. The Nuggets deserved it after having five-ish years of being close, but no cigar next to the Celtics turn. Don't at me. Um, In terms of how the city was afterwards, um, things got out of hand. I don't know. I don't want to bring on some somber news about it, but I don't know if you guys heard about what happened. Yeah, we heard. I I did hear about the shooting and everything that went on with that. I meant more of the festivities and kind of just like, because I know people were celebrating the streets. I know Aaron Gordon uh, was actually running through the streets shirtless. So he was having yep. a great time. I kind of wanted to kind of highlight on that. So how was that more? So um, were, yeah, were, Aaron, were you, ne- were you near any of that when that was going down by any um, chance? Kind of. I yeah. was working while it was happening, but okay. I was still, I was still in the city kind of in a loop mm-hmm. and yeah, Aaron Gordon did his best J.R. Smith impression, which was amazing. I don't think he'll put a shirt on until September, mm-hmm. but just in terms of that, the city is just going nuts because we got nothing better to root for. Yeah, you so guys. The, the the celebrations are still going on as we speak. That's awesome. I know the yeah. I, know, yeah, I know you guys have a championship parade tomorrow. I know that you are a New England sports fan through and through, but are you going to attend that? Um, it depends on what time it is at. I'm going to try my best to. I yeah. need to look up what time it's at tomorrow. If it's in the morning, definitely. If it's in the afternoon or 
yeah, if it's in the afternoon, I can't, which sucks. But knowing typically how they do things in Boston, I'm assuming it's going to be more in the morning. So I think you're going to have some luck on your side there. So uh, let, me, def- let me look at that real quick. Yeah, I would definitely. Say, I would definitely say to go out there and enjoy because, I mean, Adam, like it's been such a long time since we've had a championship here and. The last parade I went to was actually the final sports parade that we had in town. It was the New England Patriots after Super Bowl 53. And yeah, that was just a great time. I have tons of great memories of, you know, taking the train into town, like seeing everyone just going crazy in the streets. Um, I remember that I was literally in an alleyway um, by this hotel, like facing the state house. And I had to like kind of plead with like the security guard to a hotel to let me stand up on a flower bed just so I could see out and see all the players crossing the area. So, uh, you know, I wish that we had some more of that. And, you know, those happen pretty early in the morning. So I don't know if you have any memories of that, Adam, or anything, you know, any parade memories you have. I have some great memories going back from the 2018 run for the New England Patriots. There was just a sense of finality through that entire run. And you could just tell it was it was the beginning of the end for them and for them yeah. to go out with a championship. Not the beginning of the end. It was the end. <laughs> yeah, that that was the end. If you count 2019, where they did make the playoffs 12 and 4, they were 8-0 and to start that year. So it looked like they, they were alive and well, but I guess that was fool's gold. Yeah. But let me just t- let me let me touch on that one that one mini take that you had to begin to begin. Yeah. You said it's been a while since we've experienced a championship. You realize it's been four years since that celebration, right? Yeah, but you know, Adam, in this city where we have those expectations, it's been it's felt a lot longer. And I know that it's been what forty seven years for the Nuggets to get their first championship. Boo! That's what I'm saying. Okay, there's so many cha- there's so many cities who would kill to have to go that long with a champ without a championship. They'd set they'd be sitting there for four years saying. I remember that championship year. That oh, was no, awesome. It, listen, it was great, and, but but and it it might have been. It, I probably would remember it a little differently if Tom Brady immediately retired or things ha- happened differently. But the man went off and won his seventh ring. Like things, a lot of things have transpired within those four years. And if the Patriots were still somewhat competitive, it could be like, all right, yeah, we're just we're you know on the precipice of getting back there. And you know, I know the Celtics were just in the finals, but. With the way the Boston sports have kind of trended these past couple of years of just coming up short and not looking like we have enough, it's it's just been exhausting. Like when you're competitive, it's like, all right, man, like, yeah, we're right back to getting into that parade, right back to getting into those celebrations. But yeah, I get that. when the teams are falling short, it's just like, man, we are such a long way off. And that's more of what it is than anything. So, Rob, did you find anything about, out about that parade? Uh, it is tomorrow at 1237 p.m., meaning I will okay. not be attending. Ah. <laughs> But jeez. Oh, All right. Well, hopefully, uh, hopefully it is a good day either e- either way. But I did just want to say that the Denver Nuggets absolutely deserved the championship th- this year. They steamrolled through the competition. They were easily the best team. And they showed that in this final series against the Heat. Um, Nikola Jokic is showing that he could him. play. He He's could him. play. He could play genuinely in any era. He mm-hmm. is that good of a player. Um, He's potentially at this point, I'd say maybe a top five center of all time. You could make a case like he is that just dominant of a player. And it's not just because he's like physically imposing inside. He's also one of the league's best passers too. So he's a great passer. He's great inside. He's really good from three point range. And he's a freak. He's a freak of nature. And I've been seeing a lot of people after the fact saying that um, I think proof. Well, I mean, he's a he's an MVP, Adam. So two times, uh, yeah, Put exactly. Some respect on his name should be should, three times. Should be three. And I mean, I think Colin Coward actually ended up saying like a lot of centers now are going to be asked to do quote Embiid like things, uh, or uh, quote to do uh, quote Jokic like things, and um, they they actually made reference to Embiid saying like, oh, Embiid's considered a good passer too, and Jokic averages like ten assists, and Embiid averages four. Mm-hmm. So it's it's crazy, just like that. That's like what happens with the that like that's the just the distance in like talent level, and it's it just like he is showcased at this entire series. Like Rob, like what is the kind of the pulse on Jokic out there? I mean, he's he's a god here, and I can only imagine how they view him out there. Uh yeah, the out here we view him as the living version of Jesus Christ himself. Yeah, and that <laughs> is not an exaggeration. Um, two things that I want to run by you first. 
can we just all respect that Jokic is dominating the league while putting up step back jumpers like this? Yeah, and just kind of throwing it and with a prayer and making them. Yeah, can we it's just awesome. acknowledge that? It's awesome. And second off, a thirty second question for each of you because this has been rumored around: Was the Nuggets finals run an easy run between the eight seeded Timberwolves, seven seeded Lakers? Uh, to, who am I forgetting? Who they face in the second round? Uh, the five seeded Suns, the eight seeded Heat. Was this considered an easy finals run? I think after seeing, I'll go first. Um, I'll, I'll say this: after seeing the way that uh th- this finals happened, at least in the Eastern Conference, where the Heat really showed up and gave the Celtics all they could handle, I don't think you could say that any seed in this was going to be an easy run. I mean, the Celtics were able to avoid facing facing guys like Giannis because he was hurt, and the Heat obviously had to battle him when he was injured, so um, they took care of him. And, I mean, listen, the Lakers got hot towards the end of the year. The Suns looked legitimate at certain points when they were all out on the court and healthy. And I think it's just more a testament that the Nuggets were just that damn good, and they could just run through these guys. They were able to just completely dominate the competition. And it wasn't that there wasn't good players out there. It's just that, for, at least in the Western Conference portion of the series, they were just by far and away the better team. And then by the time you got to the finals, you did face, you know, Jimmy Butler, who, you know, he's a great player, but he doesn't have all that much with him. Oh, well, look, the the fact that they got to face a couple play in teams in the last couple of rounds, I, I could kind of understand, but. There, there is a little, there is a lot, a little bit of luck involved with most championship teams. Very rarely does the t- does the the championship caliber team just plow through everybody and just take the just take it by storm. It, that very rarely happens. There needs to be some sort of luck involved, and they got lucky that Memphis was Memphis was de- was uh, eliminated before they could even get to them. And yeah. it was the same thing with Mo- with Milwaukee, Boston, Philadelphia. Cleveland, even all of these powerhouse teams, and they got the heat. Yeah. And the, the aging Lakers. I mean, in it, there's nothing wrong with that. Sometimes that just happens, and teams pull upsets, and you get to face the, the easier matchup. Now, that's not to, that's not to take anything away from the heat. It, they were the, they were a Cinderella story, and they have, they, they, that team, they didn't have quite the talent, but they packed a punch. And yeah. they were mm-hmm. relentless, and they kept coming at you, and they were giant slayers. They took out the numbers one and two seeds in the East, Milwaukee and Boston. Those guys were not tough outs, but they got they plowed right through them. So, I mean, it it, it takes a little bit of luck there. So I don't yeah. discredit the Denver that they had to get through a couple playoff uh, playing teams. Yeah, I'll, I'll say this too. I mean, I, I just I. Again, like Nikola Jokic is the best player on the planet right now, and him and Jamal Murray, it looks like the modern modern iteration of Kobe and Shaq. The way that they just have uh, that chemistry out there, it's fantastic, yep. and it's amazing because Nikola Jokic doesn't even look like he likes what he's doing. It, the, again, the game of basketball to him is a nine to five. He won the championship, and a lot of people are making the comparison of. Kevin Garnett saying saying like anything's possible, losing his mind, like tears in his eyes. And Nikola Jokic is just saying, yeah, man, I can just go home now. I'm so done with this. Like yeah. he wants to go back to Serbia, be with his horses and just enjoy the rest of the off season. And he, he, he ends up going like, yeah, no one likes their job. Everyone is, everyone just does it, gets paid and then like leaves. That's his mentality. And uh, it's kind of funny. He reminds me of, almost of like, uh, you know, one of those like Soviet hockey players from like like all like those old like U.S. movies like uh, Miracle and whatnot. So uh, he kind of just reminds me of that with like that stone like that stone cold like killer mentality. It's like Ivan Drago from the Rocky series. It's like I'm gonna kill you and then just get out of here. So uh, I mean, I, I I think he's fantastic, and uh, I mean, I wish that Boston could almost emulate not like maybe not just like the lack of emotion. I don't want like that to be like Jason Tatum and just like that's his whole mo i like who he is but i wish that they could take some of that cold heartedness yeah. and actually like you know put that in into their game and you know actually like execute late in these series like maybe they a little use an edge to him yeah. yeah yeah i mean listen Jokic doesn't care but he, i wouldn't say Jokic doesn't care he i think in a sense he does like the game of basketball he does like what he 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 does enjoy what he does um but 
you know, I think he just do- he doesn't let the emotions get too high or low. I know a bunch of guys that are like this. And the Celtics are the complete opposite. They're big head cases. And when they get down, they fumble and they and they just like completely fall apart. So if that could be something that the Celtics could learn from this, it would be that. And it was just to, it would just be don't let these big situations get out of hand. And that's, can I give that... a can I give a counterpoint to that? Sure, go ahead. I think the Celtics are procrastinators. Mm, yes, and it's not what I the fault does not go for me to Game Seven. It goes to Games One and Two where they should have had those two games and they lost them. And then it yeah. got to a point where they couldn't make any more mistakes for the rest of the series. If they yeah. didn't, lo- if they won one of those two games, that se- that series is over in six. Yeah. So that's it- that's kind of the takeaway that I have is that they continued to play with their food, not just this, not just this postseason, but the last one as well. It almost always went seven games. Yeah. It's like it- guys, you you run into a team that capitalizes on your mistakes, then you're not going to be able to make up for it down the road. It's just that's that's the that's the take that's the takeaway that I had from that run. Yeah, no, Adam, they, that's they a, need to they need to close out these series quicker. Yeah, Adam, that's a great point that you make there. I think that something that even emulates that is when the Nuggets actually went down. Well, actually, the series got tied one one to the Heat. So uh, Nuggets took care of business game one and game two. Miami ended up winning. And after the after that game in the press conference, uh, Denver's head coach, Mike Malone, went up to the went up to the stand and basically like was calling guys out by name and was saying like, hey, like Jamal Murray, like Michael Porter Jr. was like naming guys and saying our effort stinks right now. We are not playing to the cape to the we're not playing to the capability we can. And that sparked it. And they didn't lose another game in this series. Boston, when they get down, they they just like they don't care. Like they well, they no, like wrong phrasing. They care, but like they just don't take that initiative. They yeah. don't call guys out and they just let it build. And eventually, like you said, Adam, it gets to the point where you have to play mistake free basketball. And in a competitive environment like that, it's very tough to win four straight games in a row against a team that you are seeing every single night. It's mm-hmm. impossible, at, at least to what we've seen so far. So uh, well, that that's something you can make a case for. Well, going off of that, right. Remember back in um, January of 2022, right? This team was in shamble. The Celtics team was in shambles. And then Jalen Brown posted the energy is about to shift, right? Mm. That's because they had that entire players meeting, uh, players only meeting, and they figured out everything. And it just gets to that point where they play down to competition. One thing goes bad. The next thing goes bad. And, you know, you're just left in this giant hole that you have to dig yourself out of. Something that is virtually impossible that has never happened before and i'm sure they had that meeting again after game three being down 3-0 tried to fight back but then you're right it just takes one slip up and you're done yeah because you dug yourself so far of a grave and that's just the whole thing for the celtics for this year for 2022 for 2021 ever since like ever since tatum and brown have been in the league this has been an issue well no no like when Sophomore year, Jason Tatum, like after that year, third year, Jason Tatum and on. So I want to say that was what, 2020? Yeah, that sounds right. Third year was kind of when he started to become a superstar. Yeah. Yeah. So like third year on just this entire team has just been nothing but let's play down to competition. And then Mm -hmm. when we need to light a fire under ourselves, we'll do it. And that's just not how you play. You have to stay on top of your game. I mean, just look at this entire series, right? Just get by the Hawks in six who the Hawks should blow it up. They got nothing going. Everyone except Trey Young should be gone from that team. And they traded four first round picks for DeJounte Murray, Mm -hmm. right? Against Philly, it took you seven and you were down, what, three to two or three to one in that series? Yeah. And you had to fight your way. Three, two. And you had to fight your way back through that. And then you go into Miami and get down 3-0 and have to try and claw and fight your way back just to put up an absolute stinker in game seven at home. And that just gave us hope. Yeah, yeah, that's what pissed me off the most. Right. Yeah, hope. And when you give games like that, those are games you should win because it's going to come back and bite you in the ass in game seven, which is a spot where you should never have been mm-hmm. because they because they should have they shouldn't have been to that point. You yeah. if you if if you if you capitalize on the games that you should win, then you won't have to you won't have to play mistake free basketball down the road. It won't have to be perfect. Yeah. yeah. No. Yeah, I mean, I mean, again, that's a, that's something that hopefully will come with age with the with these guys. I mean, that's something we're seeing more and more is that 
maybe it's not just a total accumulation of talent. Maybe it's that, you know, it's a maturity thing. We're seeing it with uh, Jokic and Murray. Like, it took them till, I think, what, Jokic is like eighth year in the league, Murray's seventh or sixth, and then it finally clicked. So uh, maybe that's something you can look for with this Celtics team. And, I mean, Jokic is 28. The You know, the Brown and Tatum combos, they're still very young. So maybe there's a chance it could click in the next couple of years, and, you know, they could finally – Yeah, that's – yeah, so I don't yeah. mean to cut you off. No, no worries. Yeah, I mean, not... I mean that's the big thing. Maybe it'll click in the next couple of years, but we'll have to see how that all goes. But boys, I want to transition over to some NFL news right now. Adam, I'm going to put this in your sphere. So right now, um, the New England Patriots are going to have a two day visit with DeAndre Hopkins. He's going to be coming to Foxborough. It was reported to be today and tomorrow, but um, you know, we now have that Bill Belichick line of him saying like that he's not a travel agent. So. Uh, there's a lot of speculation as to what's going to go on with that. But the expectation is that Hopkins will be in the building and that they are going to give him a look through and see if they want to offer him a deal. Apparently, um, Hopkins ended up saying that all the old issues between um, him and then Texans head coach, now New England OC Bill O'Brien have been resolved. So uh, that's a good sign. And, you know, we're going to have to see how that goes. So, Adam, I mean, you know, I, I follow football pretty, uh, I follow football pretty heavily, but you know, you have the podcast on it. So uh, kind of give me your takedown, your kind of take and your breakdown on this. Yeah. So Diana Rossini tweeted out uh, this morning that um, there is actually no animosity between Bron- uh, between Bill O'Brien and, uh, and DeAndre Hopkins. And he's even said himself that there ev- things are fine between the two. Um, so it basically comes down to does New England want to offer this this guy a contract? Uh, will they actually be seriously invested in this guy? And at first, this offseason, I wasn't too high on it just because of his age and the way the where the Patriots are right now, where they're trying to build for the future a couple years down the road to to win a championship rather than now. But the more I think about it, the more I look at Mac Jones, a guy who is still kind of a question mark, the, the jury is still out on this guy. And I look at other quarterbacks in the past, Josh Allen, Tua Tungavailoa, Joe Burrow. They were all kind of question marks until they got that elite receiver who could actually show them, this is the guy, this is, the, this is someone you want to invest in. This is, that's what the Patriots should do right now. Go out and get DeAndre Hopkins. Now, will he be there when... There's a ch- when they win a championship in in the in years down the road. I don't know. Maybe if he is, they he definitely won't be anywhere near the elite level that he can play now. But at least we will know that Mac Jones is the guy, and it will help in a developmental sense. So I think it's a a pretty good fit. I think Bill O'Brien with DeAndre Hopkins. We already know that works, and you're giving Mac Jones some weapons to throw to. You also have Juju Smith Schuster. You have a pretty good tight end duo. Um, you got Devontae Parker, Kendrick Bourne. The list goes on. Also a pretty solid defense there that's uh, starting to form. So I say you pull the trigger on that and you try to make a deal because that is uh, investing in your quarterback, not just in the wide receiver, but in your quarterback. That's extremely important. And nurturing him and giving him the pieces around him in order to succeed in the NFL, that's something that you need to do. Yeah, Adam, I got to I tend to agree with you on that. Um, the big thing I like about the Hopkins, you know, potential signing um, is just the fact that I think everyone, at least in that wide receiver depth chart, can shift to where they realistically should be playing. And I mean, you know, right now it it kind of bills itself for Juju Smith-Schuster to be the one. I mean, he probably is, I'd say, probably the more talented receiver um, between him and Kendrick Bourne, at least in terms of what I think they can do. Yeah. But if you put DeAndre Hopkins in that room, you're gonna have him, you're gonna have him lined outside outside the numbers. Then you'd probably have Juju in the slot, and then you'd have Bourne as your third, yeah, as like the third speed guy. And I think that is kind of what works. Then you'd have Tyquan Thornton, and then I'm trying to think who else we ended up, who else we have on. Oh, Devonte Parker. So Devontae, it would probably yep. it would probably go Parker as your four, uh, Thornton as your five. And I don't know what it is, but you know you take. Hopkins out of that potential depth chart and it just looks so much weaker and I know that he's a big name guy but it's not just the fact that but it's not just that it's the fact that I feel like all those guys can play more in position and have them more comfortable which is what you want to have Mac Jones feeling as well this year because coming off last year with um, Matt Patricia calling the plays 
he just did not look like him, like his rookie self back there. His first year in the league showed a lot of promise and, you know, looked like something we could really build towards. That all got torn down in year two. And I think right now for Bill O'Brien, he's just trying to tap into some of that success that we saw under that Josh McDaniels offense and see, you know, if we could get back to that. So I think yeah. Hopkins getting in there, it gets us closer to uh, what we once saw with them. So, and yeah. yeah. And like the reason for that is because all of the, all of the weapons that they have right now are all B level players who are asked yeah. to do more than they are, are capable of or have shown in the past, which is sure. too much. And sure. they also, they don't have an offensive line good enough so that B level players can, can, uh, pass the smell, pass the smell test here. Yeah. So yeah. it's important to get DeAndre Hopkins in there. So yeah, Adam, you mentioned, so you actually, you just mentioned getting DeAndre Hopkins in there. There are some talks. I know they mentioned this with Tennessee when he went to go do a visit there. And the idea was that maybe they try to make him a Titan before he even gets out of the building. And before he even gets a chance to go to new England, if you're the Patriots, do you try to make Hopkins a Patriot before he even leaves uh, Gillette? Like, how much, how hard are you really pushing to get him there? I, if I'm the Patriots, I would not let him leave Gillette until he signs that paper. Exactly. That, that's, that's my take of it. Exactly. And if you've heard some of the, some of the issues going on with Buffalo and Stefan Diggs, mm. um, you de- and also there's, there's the chiefs who need a receiver, mm-hmm. two teams with high caliber teams with high caliber quarterbacks. You look at around at that competition. You don't let him out of that building without a deal. Yeah, because I'm seeing reports now saying that he might wait till training camp to do something. But um, I think my brother actually showed me this and he ended up saying that the only thing that could sway him is if, say, the Patriots offer him a good enough contract that could get him to sign on the spot and say, you know what, this is where I'm going to plant down for the year and uh, do my thing. So hopefully they can maybe make it more than just a prove it deal, give him some incentive and say, like, hey, if you really invest here, like you're going to get your money's worth. So. Uh, I hope to see that kind of get uh, looked at, but I want to switch things over to MLB news. Now that kind of covered our NFL segment and Rob, I'll kind of lead off with you on this, but uh, uh, you know, this was something that I really liked in baseball news. We'll get to the Red Sox in just a bit, but uh, this is something that I really did like, and it was coming out of Oakland. It was the reverse boycott night at the Coliseum. And for those who don't know the Oakland A's for, for a long time now have been kind of, rumored to be leaving the city of Oakland. Uh, They actually just purchased some land in Las Vegas. There's some litigation now going on with the Las Vegas uh, uh, politicians. They're trying to get the bills and stuff passed to try to get them to move there. And then, uh, you know, the owners and whatnot would have to go to Major League Baseball and approve all that. But essentially what's happening is that the A's traditionally have not been big spenders of money, at least in this era of the way that we've known the Oakland A's. They are not the types to go out and get these big name free agents. So uh, they're mostly known for money ball and, you know, just spending low and trying to get into the playoffs that way. That's how we've always known the Oakland days to be. And what's crazy is that the Oakland days of today are actually making less money are, are actually uh, their payroll is actually less than what it was in 2002 when they had that money ball team, which is insane. The fact that they have actually managed to downsize even more. And their team is just making a little bit more than what Max Scherzer is making on the on the New York Mets right now. For one player, they have an entire ball club uh, lined up right now. So that's insane. And it all comes down to Oakland owner John Fisher, who I actually did a little check on it because I was like, oh, maybe he's like, you know, one of like these fringe kind of like owners guys. No, he's worth two point two billion. So he has the money at his disposal. I know he also owns multiple teams, but this guy has the money. And he's not putting it into this ball club because MLB has essentially what's called the revenue sharing agreement. And it takes all the money from the TV deals, merchandising, and, you know, all those general sales. And it's split evenly among all 30 teams. So this guy, by not even putting basically a cent into this team, is actually profiting regardless of anyone buying a ticket or going to his games. And they're trying to do this to say, they're essentially doing this and saying like, oh, no fans are going to the games. We don't have a fan base here. It's not working. We need to leave. And the A's decided to do this reverse boycott night where instead of not showing up to the game, they all showed up to the game, packed the Coliseum. It was a great night uh, for their specifications. It was basically a sellout and it was awesome. Rob, uh, what were your thoughts on this? Because I thought this was just awesome. 27 
thousand people going to an Oakland Athletics game is something that I didn't think I would say for the next 10 years. Yeah. And the last time I said it was in 2018 when they yeah. made the playoffs and then blew it up sequentially in 2020. But in terms of just the boycott itself, I think it was awesome. Yeah. A reverse boycott until they just started chucking trash and stuff out onto the field. And then you kind of, you kind of ruined your whole purpose. Yeah. You know, that- you're, your whole purpose of that boycott was to say, we love the Oakland days. We want them to stay here. You have the fans put together a decent team and we will be here. But then you ruined everything that you worked for by just making the field an absolute mess. You're I not do. Philly, no, right? I do. You, you can't afford to do that. Yeah, I do agree with that. And I feel bad because like the, those guys working the fields, the grounds crew, they're not part of the problem with the ownership. They're just like, they're just getting a check. They're just they're trying to do. Picture. Yeah. They're trying to do their job. That's not what they're all about. So uh, that really that 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 kind of soured it a little bit, but um, it wasn't like they just showed up and were enjoying the game. They had they sh- like thousands of them showed up in T-shirts that all said sell across it. They were having sell the team's chance. There were also some F John Fisher chants going on. And then yeah. there was this other moment during the fifth inning where they all stood up and were completely silent for like the first batter of the inning. And it was just very, in my opinion, it was really cool and I think effective to see. I don't know if it's going to do much than just put a couple extra dollars in that guy's pockets, which is unfortunate because I think that Oakland is a great baseball town. I think they do deserve a team and yeah. that their owner is just robbing them blind. And this is, you know, the complicity of major league baseball and, you know, the city of Oakland and everything that's gone on there. Uh, yeah. I, know, I know major league baseball wants to get into Las Vegas, but this is the wrong way to do it. Expansion. We've seen- you got to go expansion team. Yeah, it could easily work via expansion. We just saw it happen with the Golden Knights. They just won a championship after be, after becoming a team six years ago. So yeah. it it it's really a shame to see that that's how it kind of went here. But uh, I, I don't know. It's it it is really sad to see. Yeah, I will say though. Can we just talk about how they have now won seven games in a row? Yeah, by was... beating the Tampa Bay Rays, who are one of the best teams in baseball. Who the yeah, Red Sox are fourteen games behind, by the way. Yeah, not going to lie, that almost kind of made it like it almost kind of soured the whole idea of the reverse boycott because I want them to be like so unwatchable when all these people showed up to the stadium. But it almost made it seem like like, oh, they're getting on the bandwagon and showing up, which Mm -hmm. obviously like they're out of the playoff race. They're not making it anyways. Mm -hmm. But of course, they had to get white hot right before everything kind of uh, right before this whole thing went off. I saw a tweet talking about that. So I just thought that was kind of ironic. But yeah, I mean, it was it was really cool to see. It felt like like it was like the 2013 ALDS in there. I was I was like, what is Grant Balfour going to come into the game? Like, what the hell's happening here? This is awesome. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. It was it was great night for Oakland fans just to be able to. I know you you were paying to go to the game and all that, put a few extra dollars in his pocket, like you said. But still, you you sent a message. Yeah. You know, overall, I'm... positive night. Yeah, Adam, did you catch any of this at all? Like, I, I wanted to get your thoughts on this as well. I know you're a baseball guy, too. I did not, and uh, admittedly, uh, so I host only a football podcast for a reason. <laughs> um, I I have not been into the NF, the MLB, Jesus, uh, <laughs> quite as much uh, since I was younger. But yeah. uh, the Red Sox I have been into, but I this is the first I'm actually hearing of the reverse boycott, but that that does actually sound pretty cool. Yeah. Uh, um, and the fact that just all sports are just leaving Oakland is really sad because the Oakland the the uh, Oakland Raiders left for Vegas a few years ago, and now here we have the uh, the Oakland A's who are following suit. Both teams are very historic, and you know Golden State high, Warriors high as well profile. Yeah, what's that? The the Golden State Warriors left as well. Exactly. Every everyone's leaving Oakland, but these are very historic, well known. Uh, franchises who actually have pretty good fan bases and mm-hmm. they not may not have that much money but you can't just leave a, a historic sports city like that yeah i i tend to agree with you with that it's it really is sad to see so i mean i i almost like even if this team is to leave i hope that it's the type of thing where like it's like a cleveland brown baltimore raven thing where like oakland could at least like keep the name oakland A's. like it doesn't have like i hope it doesn't have to just be the las vegas a's like if there's a way that Oakland could keep the name and Vegas has to like rebrand, I wish it could be something like that. But yeah, like it, this has been a long time coming and it's not just cause like the team doesn't spend money. That stadium is also a wreck. Like, I mean, it's the worst stadium in the league. It's terrible to play in. It was always meant to be a football stadium 
and you can just see it straight up. It's awful. Not as bad as the race, but you know. I mean, listen, but the Rays, yeah, I mean, the Rays was like an old hockey stadium, but like, it's bad, man. It's so bad. Like, I've listen, I've been, to, I'll, I'll say this, I've been to Tropicana Field, mm-hmm. not as, it looks worse on TV. It's bad. Trust me, it is a bad stadium and it, it does need to be torn down. But the concourse there is actually kind of nice. Like, it's actually a nice concourse because it is inside. So they actually do the inside of it up well. But yeah, it feels like you're in like a parking garage when you're playing there. When you're in there, it's 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 really bad. I think the Rays just pride themselves on being this low level, um, small market team, and they mm-hmm. continuously find ways to to contend because of it. And they probably use the. I mean, I don't want to say that they purposefully have like a terrible stadium for that, but it just kind of fits the persona that they've always been proud of doing more with less and being able to compete with these uh these big market teams <clears throat> Red Sox and Yankees and being able to you know still put out a put out a competitive team which I mean credit to the Rays for being able to do that mm-hmm. yeah absolutely so uh you know I I hope I wish Oakland the best I hope that you know in some way baseball can stay alive in that city because I think that it is a really great city um you know, it's I, I remember when they were at the top of the AL West, um, you know, just only a couple of years ago. So uh, they've been able to put together winning ball clubs. And when they do, the, the fans show out. And I just hope that, you know, we can, you know, see that fan base thrive, whether it's with the A's or with someone else in the future, because they do deserve it. But uh, before we do go, I do want to just talk some uh, some Red Sox really quick, almost as a little preview to Rob's show, which is going to come out soon. He's celebrating his 100th episode. So. Uh, Rob, give me a little bit as to what we can look forward to on your show. What, so, what, are, what um, are we gonna What are we gonna What are we gonna be talking? Mainly uh, Red Sox talking. Oh, obviously Red Sox, but yeah. talking about uh, Trevor Story and his injury update. Uh, moving Kike Hernandez to the bench. He's not a mm-hmm. starter anymore. Yeah. Honestly, in my opinion, he should be with you guys in Worcester because it kind of sucks. Um, and yeah, just a couple of every week, just talking about how much this team sucks, and we're fourteen games back of the a at least yes it's the worst or the best division in baseball but we are currently under 500 and the only team and they're currently under 500 so if you just want to listen to us rant about the red Sox, i'm sure links will be down in the description yeah i i want to do my own little take on them as well because listen they had a good weekend they went into new york and they took two out of three from that from that yankees team i know they were without aaron judge but uh, the one thing you can hang your hat on is that their young pitching looked very good. Brian Bayo was fantastic on Sunday night baseball. He looks mm-hmm. awesome. So you can make a case that uh, him, Hauk, Whitlock uh, could, you know, become something in like maybe three to five years. Like they could actually really build into something. I remember specifically being down working with the Woo Sox Foundation last year and going to Woo Sox games, seeing Brian Bayo starts. They were well talked about. It was almost like, I mean, I remember when people would kind of talk about when Pedro Martinez would make a start in Boston and it's not like to that level where people are going nuts, but when Brian Bayo made a start in Worcester, it was at the top of everyone's agenda saying like, Hey, we need to be on, we need to be on our, on, on our, you know what tonight. Cause like fans are going to pack the ballpark. It's going to be a crazy night. And like, we need to be selling, you know, 50, 50 raffle tickets. We need to be, you know, doing our job with concessions. Cause like people are going to come to the stadium tonight. Yep. And, and that was something that was well understood. So uh, that's the one thing I guess you could take away from him. I think that he does have the case to be electric going forward. Uh, but the big thing is, you know, I, as good as those guys can be, I mean, maybe Marcelo Mayer is the answer too, but, you, this team needs to spend and like you're 14th in the league in payroll and it doesn't seem like anything's changing. And that's, what's so frustrating. Cause I think that John Henry's content right now. I don't think that, um, you know, he's just trying to get onto the next, onto whatever the next thing's going to be, whether it's uh getting a uh, bat, what, whether it's going to be, you know, maybe purchasing the, uh, whatever future expansion team's going to come to the NBA in Vegas, mm-hmm. um, doing his stuff with the Pittsburgh Penguins. So the Red Sox don't seem like his first priority right now. Yeah. And that that's the unfortunate thing, because you essentially had to guilt him into paying Rafael Devers. It didn't seem like he really wanted to do that deal. But when he got booed at the Winter Classic, he said, fine, we'll give him 10 years, whatever, whatever money he wants. But you let Xander Bogarts go. Now you have this giant gaping hole at shortstop. And it's just a we'll mess. We'll talk right about now, that. Yep. It's a we'll it's talk. a it's a mess, Robert. It's it's so bad. I 
I will never turn my back on this team, but let's just say I enjoy watching the Rockies more just because there's no expectation there. And yeah, the stadium, I, I'm I'm you guys are gonna hate me for saying this. Fenway is much more classic, but the Rocky Stadium is so much better. I'm in ter- I'm ter- what in terms of being modern? In, no, just in terms of like beauty altogether. The Fenway Fenway will always be a classic. It will always be. It's a gorgeous stadium, but this Rocky Stadium with the mountains behind it and the forest in the center. Oh my god, that stadium is gorgeous. You guys, yeah, don't Ro- even know. Yeah, Rob. I think that mile high oxygen, it like that lack of oxygen, it's it's, effect, it's affecting your brain because I don't That's think what I'm saying. I, I, I yeah. don't think you've fully adjusted to it yet because you sound a little insane. So I'll give you a pass on that based on the fact that you're in a really rough climate. So uh, I'm been gonna, in Denver too long. Yeah, I'm gonna ignore. I'm the, yeah, I'm gonna ignore that you said that. There's multiple factors at play here. No, um, it's it's true. It's damn true. Okay. Yeah. G- go. Go go nuts, you freaking yogi. Next, um, he's going to start talking about Russell Wilson like Jesus. Yeah, really. I mean, he's, <laughs> he's, already, he's no, already. That's right. Hey, hey they, they hate. We hate Russell Wilson around here. Like, yeah, it's it's bad. It's borderline. They're going to find his 12 bathroom mansion and break in. Yeah. Like, it's, I mean, it's bad. yeah, I, I, can, I can imagine it's pretty bad. And man, I just got to say, I, I hope the Red Sox can find the right keys going forward. I mean, it's not going to be this year. This year, I have no expectations for this team and. Listen, I sometimes relish in it when they're bad. I'm, I'm just like, I don't want it to be halfway if they're bad. Like, I don't want them to be a 500 team. If they're going to yep. win, I want them to win. But if they're going to be bad, oh, I want it to, I want it to blow up so bad. Because I, yeah, just, I, just I, I, it, 2020. I, I, no, yeah, not 2020. I want it to be like the 2014 trade deadline, 2015, where they're selling guys off and it's bad. And, and you're well, like, 2020, they were the fourth worst team in the league. The only no, teams that were worse were the Orioles. No, but I but I want them to have to sell guys off and, and then and then have John Henry get mm. all pissed and then go out and spend a bunch of free agents. That's when things get. Yep. That's when things yeah. happen. When you're 500, you can say, "Oh, well, we we were just like one you know piece away from doing this. We just have to keep doing our philosophy." When you're bad, 2012, it, it, 14, and 15 were the best losing years. Yeah, those it, are the years where you could really tear into this team. Yeah, they were yeah. selling at the deadlines. They were still trying to make an effort to salvage it. That was those were the best years. Twenty twelve was some, about just tanking. Twenty twelve was something else. They 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 signed Adrian Gonzalez and immediately had to ship him out of town. And it was just like, I, I mean, as I remember, as like a, as like an eleven year old kid, I was like really upset about that because I was like, oh man, we had Adrian Gonzalez and now we have like Mauro Gomez at first base, and it's like, oh Jesus Christ. But uh, man, I just. When they're bad, it's like it's somewhat like it's morbidly like enjoyable to like watch them because it's like you get to just see it crash and burn. And then when heads start to roll, like Heim Blooms will eventually at some point, like he's going to eventually be out of a job. And, you yeah. know, who who knows? Potentially Alex Cora is going to see his day, too. So uh, I, I like Cora. I hope that he does stay around, whether it says the manager and maybe in a GM role, who knows what that's going to look like. But uh, if it's time bloom, if it's all these like, you know, analytics guys, I'd love to see them kind of get blown out of town and bring in another Dombrowski type. I know they're not, I know it's kind of few and far between now, but bring in someone who actually knows the game of baseball, isn't just going to look at a stat sheet and can actually win you games. Cause we're seeing it right now. You can win with a money ball philosophy, but not with Hein Bloom's money ball philosophy. We're seeing that he really didn't have as much of an influence with the Tampa Bay Rays as people touted him to. He's a fraud. He needs to get out of town now because he Jesus. cannot do the job. It's awful, Rob. He's you okay? You should have been on the episode last week because yeah. we we talked all about that. Don't worry, I'm, I'll, I'll tear him tonight. I'm gonna go off topic on your show because I've had an, I've had enough of these teams. If there's any team that I'm passionate about in Boston, it is the Red Sox. Baseball is my first love. I love that sport. I obviously have passion for the Patriots. Uh, either it's tied, either it's like the one A or tied for second. And then, you know, the Celtics and the Bruins I root for as well. But the Red Sox are the team I can relate to the most. I played that game. I love it. And when I see it just being just trashed the way that they are, I mean, I just want things to change so quickly. And maybe that is with the future. Maybe that maybe Marcelo Mayer can do that for you. But, man, I really just hope and pray. So, yeah. Rob, we're going to sign things off here. I, we are now down to the wire. Um, I, I if, Unless you guys have any final words. Rob, do you have anything you want to say? Um, going back to the NBA thing, um, something that I just saw on my phone, um, D'Angelo Russell, right. You mm-hmm. know how bad he was in the Lakers playoff series. Yeah. 
Uh, yeah, there is currently the bet to which team he will go to next. Yeah. Uh, one of the top 10 teams is the Guangdong Tigers. Okay? <laughs> That's how bad it's gotten. It's at 18 to 1 odds, but it's a top 10 team on where he's going to be next season on the Guangdong Tigers. Ni hao, D'Angelo. Love Ni it. Hao. That's awesome. Well, we are down to the wire. So before we do that, um, I'll, I'll, I'll kind of let you guys like give your uh, little spiel as to how to find you. Adam, I'll let you go first, Um, you know. Feel free to, um, you know, shout out your Insta and everything like that. Well, definitely go and check out the Fumble Rooski podcast for coverage on the latest on the NFL. Even if there's nothing going on in the NFL, like right now in the summertime, which is one of the great dead spots in professional football, we do plenty of stuff still. Division previews, um, on NFL honors predictions, power rankings, uh, player rankings, all of that stuff. So definitely go check us out. We're on Instagram at FumbleRooski underscore podcast. We're at we're on Spotify, Spreaker, Apple Podcasts, iHeartRadio, Google Podcasts, all those different uh, different platforms. So go check us out. Yeah, and then Rob, I'll throw it over to you as well. I know we got episode one hundo coming up, so I'll let you uh, tell the people where to find that. Yep, we're about to record episode one hundred in about five or ten minutes. So it will be up tomorrow. I'm not sure exactly what time, but Thursday, June 15th, it will be up and we will be, you'll hear, let's let's just say we got a crazy weird segment coming up at the end that you will not want to miss the beautiful bastard Brian Costive's opinions on. He doesn't even know what it is yet, but I, I'm morbidly curious, like the Red Sox. So, yes, uh, we'll all, have to... all I'm saying is you guys just for surprise are not allowed to look at the Pesky Pole Podcast Instagram. And I need you to stay true to that until after the episode's done. Sounds good. Okay. All right. All right. Well, you guys, if you guys want to follow down to the wire, say you just stumbled across this podcast for the first time. Uh, we're available on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, all of those different streaming platforms. We're also on YouTube where you can watch all of our beautiful faces. And you can find us on Instagram at down dot to the wire again at down dot to the wire. So thank you guys so much for watching the show. My name is Brian Costa. I'm Robert Shelley. I'm Adam Wright. And we hope you guys have a great rest of your day. Take care and peace out.